Sehr geehrter Rabbi Joseph Teluschkin, sehr geehrter Rabbi Huda Teichtal, sehr geehrte Gäste aus den Bezirksräten der Senatsverwaltung, den Bezirksfraktionen und der US-amerikanischen Botschaft. Sie alle, einschließlich der hier anwesenden Damen und Herren und Gäste des Jüdischen Museums Berlin und die Freunde der Lubavitcher Chassidim, begrüße ich hiermit sehr herzlich zu einem Vortrag über Menachem Mandel Schnerson, der zu Ehren seines 20. Todestages von Rabbi Teluschkin gehalten wird. Wie Sie alle wissen, ist das Jüdische Museum als historisches Museum in erster Linie der, mit der Vergangenheit befasst. Das trifft auf jeden Fall für unsere Dauerausstellung zu und auf viele Wechselausstellungen. Aber auch die Kenntnisnahme der Gegenwart und das Nachdenken über die Zukunft, nicht nur der Juden und des Judentums in Deutschland, sondern weltweit, sind für uns wichtige Themen, die in vielfältigen Programmen aufgenommen werden. Das jüdische Deutschland hat sich in den fast 70 Jahren nach Kriegsende mehrmals radikal verändert, auch im Hinblick auf die Einstellung zur Religion und die Ausgestaltung des liturgischen Alltags. Mit Ausnahme von Berlin, wo es seit Jahrzehnten eine Reformgemeinde gab, befanden sich unter dem Dach des in Deutschland einmaligen Typus der sogenannten Einheitsgemeinde in den ersten Nachkriegsjahrzehnten hauptsächlich orthodoxe Synagogen, die nach dem osteuropäischen Ritus Gottesdienst feierten. In den vergangenen zwei Jahrzehnten differenzierte und diversifizierte sich das Bild der jüdischen Gemeinschaft in Deutschland. Neben der bekannten Gemeindeorthodoxie entstanden Reformgemeinden mit weiblichen Rabbinern und Kantoren, was in den 90er Jahren als Revolution empfunden wurde. Seit den 1980er Jahren haben sich auch die Lubavitcher Chassidim in Deutschland niedergelassen und Synagogengemeinden gegründet, die inzwischen ein integraler Bestandteil des Judentums in Deutschland geworden sind. Rabbiner Jehuda Teichtal, der Gastgeber und Mitveranstalter des heutigen Abends, ist sowohl Gemeinderabbiner der jüdischen Gemeinde zu Berlin als auch Gesandter des Lubavitcher Rebben in Berlin. Für uns sind die Lubavitcher Chassidim und ihre Geschichte eine interessante Erscheinung des zeitgenössischen Judentums. Sie unterhalten eine weltumspannende Organisation, die auf allen Kontinenten und in den entlegensten Orten der Welt jüdische Gemeinden gründen. Ein gerahmtes Foto des Rebben ist mir auf Reisen in Kairo und Alexandrien in China und Russland begegnet. Diesem Phänomen hat Joseph Teluschkin sein Buch Rebbe, The Life and Teachings of Menachem Schnerson, The Most Influential Rabbi in Modern History, gewidmet. Er wird uns heute Abend darüber berichten. Am Ende möchte ich noch meinen Dank an Sibylla Bendig vom Auswärtigen Amt aussprechen, die uns so großzügig geholfen hat, die simultan Übersetzung zu finanzieren. Und ich wünsche Ihnen allen und uns allen einen interessanten Abend. Danke. Shalom, guten Abend. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, wichtigen Gäste, Quadarav, Teluschkin, liebe Zilli, alle heute, die hier sind, Quadarabanim, es ist ein großen Ehre und Freude, hier alle willkommen zu heißen. Als neunjähriger Kind in 1981, am Samstagmorgen, war ich einmal unterwegs mit meiner Schwester und Papa auf die Wege in die Synagoge und plötzlich auf Eastern Parkway kommen wir entgegen der Lubavitcher Rebbe. Er schaut uns an, blickt uns an und sagte, Shabbat Shalom. Danach ging der Rebbe weiter und dort war ein Polizist, ein bisschen später ein Postarbeiter und ein bisschen weiter auf die Straße jemand, der die Straßenreinigung gemacht hat. Zu jeder hat der Rebbe begrüßt und gesagt, Hallo, Shabbat Shalom. Diese Wärme, diese Liebe, diese Aufmerksamkeit zu jedem Mensch bleibt nach bei unserem Herz bis heute und ist eine Quelle von Ermutigung und von Licht, von Energie für unsere Arbeit. Der Rebbe, wie wir wissen, hat jeden Sonntag Dollars verteilt 
an Menschen und gesagt, gib dieses Dollar für einen dritten Mensch, helf jemanden anders. Und einmal eine Frau kam zu der Rebbe und hat gesagt, Rebbe, ich bin so müde, ich stehe hier seit zwei Stunden, ich habe keine Kraft, wie schaffst du es? Und der Rebbe hat gesagt, wenn man zählt Brillanten, wird man nicht müde. Der Rebbe hat gezeigt uns, wie jeder Mensch, ob Jude oder Christ, jung oder alt, obdachlos oder Präsident, jeder Mensch ist ein Brillant. Aber wer war der Rebbe? Und wie ist es, dass 20 Jahre nach dem, was der Rebbe nicht mehr hier ist, bleibt er im Herzen von Millionen Menschen in der Welt? Das wird uns heute Abend Joseph Telushkin erzählen. In seinem neuen Buch, die seit Wochen auf die Bestsellerliste von der New York Times ist. Heute Abend, als wir stehen im Schatten von den drei ermordeten jungen Yeshiva-Boys, die ermordet waren in Israel, unsere, unsere Gedanken sind mit die und wir wollen die heute Abend erwähnen, Heute Abend begrüßen wir Joseph Teluschkin und wir wollen lernen von der Weisheit der Rebbe. Heute Abend möchte ich Danke sagen an das Jüdisches Museum, an die Leitung und insbesondere an Zilli, an Zilli Kugelmann, die seit Monaten lang uns alles gemacht hat, unterstützt mit ihrer Erfahrung, mit ihrer Weisheit und mit ihrer Ermutigung in diesem Abend. Zilli, vielen Dank. Aber nicht nur an dir, Zilli, die ganze Team. Geza, Signe Rosbach, Sascha Perkins, alle haben viel Mühe gegeben. Frau Bendig, vielen Dank für die Unterstützung und die Besetzung. Die Koordinatoren für diese Veranstaltung aus unserer Seite, jemand, die sehr viel Zeit und Mühe gegeben hat, ist Frau Chava Pipenko. Dafür würde ich sagen, vielen Dank, Chava, für diese wichtige Hilfe. Heute Abend sind die Getränke gespendet von Klaus Bier und die Geschirrverleih von Universum Geschirrverleih. Aber auch möchte ich Danke sagen an Nella Schub und Fima Blacker, die haben uns ermöglicht, Herr Rabbiner Teluschkin nach Berlin zu bringen. Und eine besondere Begrüßung an Herr Roman Schwarz und Mischa und Anna Uris, die sehr, sehr, die eine Säule von Unterstützung sind zum Aufbau und Weiteraufbau von jüdischer Leben in Berlin. Danke, Roman und Mischa und Anna. Rabbiner Teluschkin, wenn Sie nicht gekommen heute mir zu hören, everybody came to hear you. So I better get off the stage and it's all yours, Rabbi. A hearty welcome, Bruchem Abayim, Liberlin. I am filled with a sense of humility at coming here today to speak about the Rebbe in Germany. Obviously, I grew up at a time, I grew up in the 1950s when the Jewish community had a very difficult relationship with Germany. And all Jews throughout the world have been so moved also by the German outreach to the Jewish people. And the thought that there is now an increasingly vibrant Jewish community in Germany is very, very important and very meaningful to me. And I'm filled, as I said, with a sense of humility because I want to convey the message of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. What I try to do in the book, Rebbe, is to tell the story of the rabbi who helped fashion the most dynamic movement in modern Jewish religious life. When Menachem Mendel Schneerson became the leader of Chabad, it was a relatively small movement headquartered in one section of Brooklyn, New York. Yet he had a vision that no other leader in Jewish life had previously had He wanted to reach out to every Jewish community in the world and to every Jew in the world. It is, I don't believe, a coincidence that this all came about in the aftermath of the Holocaust. As Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of England, put it, if the Nazis tried to hunt down every Jew in hate, the Rebbe wanted to hunt down every Jew in love because he wanted to bring back that love of Judaism. The most important thing was that he wanted to recreate the life that so many Jews who had died had lived. He wasn't focused in that regard on, on their death, but on their life, and that's what he wanted to bring back. In the United States, where I live, there are today Chabad houses in 48 of the 50 American states and Chabad is represented now in 80 countries. A dear friend of mine spent Shabbat in the Chabad house at Phnom Penh, Cambodia. When I was growing up, I didn't know that there was 
any Jews in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, but today there really is outreach to those Jews. The largest Passover Seder in the world last year was held in Kathmandu, Nepal. 1,100 people attended the Seder there. Many of them were young Israelis who were backpacking in, in Nepal and who might well not otherwise have attended a Seder. What I try to do in Rebbe is to tell the story of the Rebbe and the lessons of leadership that he conveyed and what we can learn from them. But I also want to emphasize something else as well. The Rebbe's message and love was not only directed to the Jewish community. In the course of researching his life, I came across many remarkable stories that show just how broad his outreach was. And it makes sense. The Jews, whatever one thinks about the notion of chosen people, the Jews, the Jews had felt their mission was to make known in the world the idea that there is one God, one universal law, that there is the brotherhood of all human beings. The Rebbe was one of those who was an heir to that tradition. So in researching the book, I came across a remarkable incident. In 1968, an African-American woman named Shirley Chisholm became the first woman ever elected in the United States to Congress. At that time, it was only a few years after the Civil Rights Act had passed, the situation of blacks in America was much less secure. The heads of the House of Representatives, Southern Democrats, many of whom were racists, put her on the Agriculture Committee. Anyone who knows Brooklyn, New York, knows it was absurd. She came from a poor black area, Bedford-Stuyvesant, but also from Crown Heights, which was the area where the Rebbe lived. And as one New York newspaper headlined it, a tree grows in Brooklyn. It made no sense to put her there, and it was done to marginalize her. She was very upset, and the Rebbe learned of her upset and met with her. And when she came in to see the Rebbe, she expressed how angry she was at what had happened. And the Rebbe said, what you see as an insult actually is a challenge to you from God. The Agriculture Committee deals with all the extra surplus food being produced in the United States. So much of that food now is wasted. The government pays farmers not even to plant food on certain lands because so much excess food was being produced in the United States. And yet, there were people in the United States who still didn't have enough food. And so the Rebbe said to her, you can now use this as an opportunity to make sure that more poor people are getting food. In 1983, when Shirley Chisholm retired from Congress, she gave a public speech in which for the first time she spoke about her encounter with the Rebbe and she said two things. A rabbi who is an optimist taught me that what you think is a challenge is a gift from God. And then she said, if poor babies have milk and poor children have food, it is because this rabbi in Brooklyn had vision. What was that vision of the Rebbe? We're gonna look a little later at the notion of love that he had but it was also the understanding that every act counts. There are no such things as trivial mitzvot, trivial commandments. I remember when I was a teenager, I was born in 1948. When I was a teenager, an American astronaut, John Glenn, circled the world in the early 60s. And the then American president, John Kennedy, who I thought of just a few moments ago, when I was taken to see the remnants of the Berlin Wall, and I recalled, of course, Kennedy's famous speech here. John Kennedy was then president, and he said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the 60s. And referring to Glenn circling the world, he quoted a Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. What the Rebbe understood was was that any mitzvah, any commandment, could be the step that could help bring a person back to a life of full commitment. In the case of Jews, to a fully Jewishly committed life. In the case of non-Jews, to a fully righteous life. 
But the Rebbe understood something even further. The expression, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, suggests that each step matters only because it's part of that journey. For the Rebbe, each mitzvah had value in and of itself. When he started the campaign to encourage Jewish men to put on tefillin, which Jewish men are instructed to wrap around their arms and their head every morning when they pray, or to encourage Jewish women to light candles, Shabbat candles, to bring light into their house every Friday night, there were those, even among very traditional Jews, who thought this was a foolish idea. He said, what's the sense of getting a Jew to observe this commandment if, he's not, if he or she are not going to keep the other commandments? And the Rebbe said, no, each commandment, each good act that we do has a value in and of itself. Eventually, it might well influence people to more, but it still has a value in and of itself as we do it. That led to one of the other innovations of Chabad in Jewish life. In America, where the campaign started to encourage women to light Shabbat candles. So every Friday in the New York Times, which is obviously the most widely read, the most prestigious newspaper in the United States, there would be a little ad on the middle of the page. Jewish women and children, please light Shabbat, Jewish women and, and Jewish girls, please light Shabbat candles, let's say at 6, 10 p.m., whatever time Shabbat was beginning. Some Jews would look at it to be reminded when they should light candles. Others just knew there was somebody out there who cared about them. Now I'll tell you a humorous story, but it's a true story. On January 1st, 2000, the New York Times published its millennial edition. The new centennial, not centennial, the new millennium was beginning. On that day, they published two, three front pages. The front page for January 1st, 2000, they republished the front page for January 1st, 1900, and then they, then they published an imagination for January 1st, 2100. It had all sorts of articles that were hard to follow, like the argument going on, should robots be allowed to vote in elections? Everything made it seem like a very strange and alien world. And then in the middle of the page, there was a little announcement Jewish women and girls, candle lighting tonight, and then it listed the time of the candle lighting. I found out the background of the story. It turned out that the editor for that page for January 1st, 2100, was an Irish Catholic man, an editor who lived in New York, and he happened to notice that January 1st, 2100 really was going to fall on a Friday. And so he called up someone at Chabad and he said, could you tell me on that Friday night, January 1st, 2100, what time Shabbos candles are going to be lit? That's how he found out how to put it in. The Rebbe became known for his sense of unconditional love for humanity and his unconditional love and his outreach for the Jewish people. On the one hand, this doesn't sound like something so startling. After all, probably the most famous law in the Torah in the first five books of the Bible is the law, love your neighbor as yourself. Those two essential commandments, love God, which is part of the Shema, and love your neighbor as yourself. We find that even in earlier Jewish history, two of the most famous rabbis of the Talmud, Hillel and Rabbi Akiva, put extraordinary emphasis on love your neighbor as yourself. Rabbi Akiva says, v'yahavta l'rayacha kamocha zeklal gadol Torah. Rabbi Akiva teaches, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a major or the major principle of the Torah. Nonetheless, if you look in Jewish history, we find there wasn't always such great love even amongst Jews for each other. The Talmud attributed the destruction of the second temple to causeless hatred within the Jewish community. And we're talking about probably the most cataclysmic event in Jewish history prior to the Holocaust. It is estimated that about a million Jews died at that time, and the Talmud attributes it to hatred within the Jewish community. In the 13th century, 
The Dominican order within Catholicism was carrying out the Inquisition in France, and three French rabbis bring to them writings from Moses Maimonides, the greatest Jewish scholar in many ways of the past thousand years, because they say it contains heresy. And what happens is the Dominicans burn his works. They burn particularly his philosophic work known as the Guide to the Perplexed, Morer Nuvuchim. And then they start looking at other Jewish writings and they end up burning the Talmud as well in the year 1240. And the burning of the Talmud in any time would be a terrible tragedy. We all know what happens when books get burned. But it was an even greater tragedy at that time when books were not printed. Every volume of the Talmud was handwritten. One of the rabbis who participated in that act was named Yonah Jarundi, and he was so overcome with remorse at the time the Talmud was burned, he realized what a terrible thing he had done against Maimonides, and he wrote a book, Sharei Tshuva, The Gates of Repentance, which is still studied. So what the Rebbe understood was the Jewish community needed a teaching of unconditional non-judgmental love. It's widely known that there are 613 laws in the Torah. Probably the one I suspect that is least observed is a law, B'Tzedak Tishpot Amitecha. In fairness, in justice shall you judge your fellow. How often do many of us unfairly judge others? You know, how often in the course of a day when somebody has done something and there are two ways we could interpret it, we interpret it in the more critical way. There's an expression in English, I jump to a conclusion. And it usually means you jump to a negative conclusion. You know, it's not usually I jump to a conclusion that he is really a wonderful human being. You know, when two people speak about another, do we usually focus on their wonderful qualities? If I divided this whole room up into groups of two, and ask you to spend 20 minutes speaking about somebody you both know, is it likely you'll spend the whole 20 minutes saying, oh, I, that's a, I know a wonderful story about, oh, I know an even nicer story. You know, usually we'll talk about what's not so nice because it's more interesting. If you and I are talking about someone we both know and you say, I love that guy, there's only one thing I don't like about him, what are we gonna start talking about? So what the Rebbe was trying to introduce was a standard of unconditional love. When a man named George Rohr, and the Chabad house here is named for the Rohr family. George is, in addition to there being a very generous family, he is also himself a knowledgeable Jew. And one year he led a service for Jews who had no real religious background for the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And he then met with the Rebbe, and he said to the Rebbe with great pride, I conducted a Rosh Hashanah service, a New Year's service for 180 Jews who had no background. So the Rebbe looked at him in a way that seemed unhappy. George, thinking that the Rebbe had not heard him because the Rebbe was already then quite old, so he said in a louder voice, I conducted a service for 180 Jews who had no background. And the Rebbe said, what do you mean they had no background? They're the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. Part of what was spectacularly important about the lesson the Rebbe communicated, and this is important for the shluchim, the emissaries of the Rebbe, and it's important for every single one of us in this room. It was not just a love of groups. It was not just to say he loved the Jewish people. It was not just to say he loved humanity. He always kept his love focused on the individual. That was very, very important. I know that story from my own family history, and it's probably an incident that influenced me. I am not, as you can perhaps tell, I am not a member, so to speak, of Chabad, I, but I grew up in a family that had very strong ties to Chabad. But I really entered the writing of this book. An outsider sounds like I'm a cold outsider, but I entered it as somebody who was not living the, uh, my life in, within the Chabad world. And my studies, my graduate work had been in history. I wanted to study the phenomenon of this man who had had a very big impact. I entered the book with a positive attitude towards the Rebbe, as I've explained to others, why else would one want to spend five years of one's life studying another person's life? But nonetheless, I came in not from within the community, 
Now I forgot the whole point I wanted to make. Uh, yes, but one of the things I came to appreciate was the extent, and this is why this is so important for every one of us, you can have all the right political views and you can support all the programs of social justice in every positive way. You can do so as a liberal, you can do so as a conservative. But the final proof of the goodness of what's motivating you is your actions on a one-to-one -one level with other individuals. This is what was remarkable about the Rebbe. He was concerned with big major issues that were going on. He stayed focused on the individual. In June of 1986, I was living in Israel, and I got a phone call from my mother that my father had had a stroke. My father, by the way, was an accountant, and one of his accounts was the Rebbe. My father happened to be the accountant, a distinguished accountant, account to have. He was the accountant uh, for the Rebbe, and he'd even been the accountant for the Rebbe's father-in-law, the previous Rebbe. And so my mother told me my father had a stroke. It was a serious stroke. And of course, I immediately flew back to the United States. My father was in a coma. Every day, we received two phone calls from the Rebbe's office. The Rebbe wants to know how your father is. My father then comes out of the coma. Unfortunately, he was partially paralyzed, and he never regained full use. And he would sometimes be a little confused and mixed up. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. A few days later, I get a call from Rabbi Krinsky, a very close aide secretary to the Rebbe. The Rebbe has a financial accounting question for your father. I said to him, Rabbi Krinsky, my father's in intensive care in the hospital. He's very, very sick. He said, of course, the Rebbe knows that, but he had a question for your father. At that point, I brought the question to my father. My father thought about it for a minute and then said, the answer is obvious, and then he told me the answer. I was moved by that experience, and I'll tell you why. I realized what had happened. None of us in our family were thinking of discussing accounting with my father. The Rebbe was sitting at his desk in his office, dealing with issues that affected the Jewish people throughout the world, but he also remembered that there was a man lying in a hospital bed in Manhattan who was confused, who didn't know if he was going to get better, who felt that much of his usefulness in the world had probably come to an end. And the Rebbe came up with a question. He had the moral imagination to come up with a question that my father could answer. That's the remarkable feature to be a world leader, a world class leader, and to remain focused like that on the individual. I try to identify in my books, in my book, seven traits of the Rebbe, what I call seven virtues, that I think help account for an unusual phenomenon. How does a movement survive and expand after its leader dies? Normally, we can assess whether or not a movement is successful, uh, successful by what happens when the movement's leader dies. In Chabad's case, the Rebbe was sick. Ironically, as I described my father's stroke, ironically, the Rebbe had a stroke that was in that regard even worse than my father's because my father suffered paralysis but could always speak. The Rebbe in the last two years of his life could not speak. And during that time, many predictions were made that Chabad was going to become a smaller movement. It might even, its whole survival might even be threatened. And yet, of course, Chabad in the aftermath of the Rebbe's death went on and has expanded tremendously and continues to expand. My friend Dennis Prager defines the word remote as meaning a place so small that there is no Chabad representative there. In any case, one of the things I learned that the Rebbe did was remarkable. When you read accounts of people who had private meetings with the Rebbe, a few things always get mentioned. One is they, rem they remember the Rebbe's eyes and the way his eyes would focus on them. And then they remember the way they felt his entire concentration was on them. And one of the virtues, so to speak, that I identify and explain in the book, and to me this is the heart of the book because it can help every single one of us here, 
I am not only trying in the book to account for an historical phenomenon of how a man created a movement for good. We are all familiar historically with movements that have been created for evil and that have motivated people with evil desires to conquer others. What's really powerful is to study the life of a person from any religious tradition, the life of a person who marshaled forces to get people to do good. And part of it was that focus on the individual. But one of the traits I identify there in the Rebbe's work ethic is something the Rebbe called Hatzlacha Bizman, how to be successful with time. And believe me, this isn't just a question of being a, good, a, a more good human being morally, it's a problem we all have. The problem is we get up in the morning, we have things we want to do that day, and we haven't accomplished them. January 1st, we make plans for what we're going to accomplish during the year. And then the following January 1st, we make the exact same plans. You know, we haven't always done it. How many of you find that often in the course of a day you don't accomplish what you intended? Okay, I'm speaking to the most remarkable group of human beings in the world. Okay, finally, two people back there. How many people here are sitting next to somebody who doesn't accomplish all that they intended? <laughs> anyway, so the Rebbe taught, what does it mean to be successful in time? And he claimed that he learned this lesson from his father-in-law. His father-in-law was the fifth Rebbe, the sixth Rebbe, and had been in Russia under the communists. And eventually he was arrested by the communists. It looked for a while as if he was actually going to be executed. And there was a certain international outcry and he was fortunately saved, but basically he was exiled from Russia. But before then, for years, he was followed by the KGB. He lived a very unpleasant sort of existence. And he was about to make a trip he lived in St. Petersburg, and he was about to make a trip, by then it was probably Lenin, called Leningrad, to Moscow. A long train ride, during which everybody knew he was going to be followed by the secret police, they were going to check every movement that he made. It was going to be scary. And Menachem Mendel Schneerson, his soon-to-be son-in-law, was very nervous. And he walks into the room where his father-in-law is sitting, and he sees his father-in-law is very calmly making notes, writing letters, studying from a book. He said, how can you be so calm? And he said his father-in-law then taught him something that affected him for the rest of his life. He said he in turn had learned from his father, accept the fact that time is finite. There is a limited amount of time. No matter what you do, no matter how many headstands you want to turn, there are 60 minutes in an hour, there are 24 hours in a day, there are 60 seconds in a minute. You can't change that. What you can change, though, is this, what you do at that time. If when you're working on one task, you're thinking about something that happened in the past, or you're allowing your mind to stew up over an argument you had with somebody and going over it again and again, or thinking about the future and worrying about what's gonna to happen to me on this trip to, Saint, to Moscow from St. Petersburg. He said, all that will happen is you won't change the past, you won't change the future, and you won't accomplish anything in the now. So what the Rebbe had as an attribute, his trait was, how do you just stay focused on the now? If any of us, if you try this experiment tomorrow for five minute period, just focus on what you are doing and do not allow any other thoughts to intrude. Resist them when they start to intrude because you'll get better at it. He says that's what it means to have atzlacha bizman. That's how the Rebbe was able to meet with one person after another. And that person could then discuss with him something of the greatest significance in their lives and he could stay focused on them. This is hard for many of us. How many of you have ever been on a telephone conversation and while somebody was talking at length, you were looking at your emails? Okay, I gather that it's true of you. I'm not gonna ask anybody, who, the same two people who answered honestly before, okay. Listen, you're honest people back there. Okay, no, so we all know what it means to really be focused. I've seen myself sometimes do that. And then I remember, because I was influenced in the writing of this book, what's the point of studying a person's life for five years if it doesn't then in any way impact on your own? 
You know, sometimes you could study a person's life and see a not good thing that, that happened in their lives that diverted them from achieving more. And in this case, I found many, many techniques that have really continued to impact me on a daily basis. So I'll suddenly realize my mind is drifting. This person is telling me something important to them and I'm not focusing. So Hatzlacha Bizman, success with time, means you focus on the task that's right in front of you and you continue to do it. Another attribute of the Rebbe, he wanted to create leaders. Now it's remarkable, there are so many people who are devoted to the Rebbe that people think that all he was interested in was creating followers. The truth was he wanted to create leaders because he knew he couldn't go out everywhere into the world. One of the people I inter interviewed for the book, Rabbi Groner, Label Groner, told me that early in life he had once asked the Rebbe a legal question in Jewish law. It had to do with the circumcision of his twin sons. It was a, compl a complicated question. And the Rebbe, instead of giving him an answer, said to him, you're a rabbi like me. Like me, you also have smicha, rabbinical ordination. You can answer the question. You don't need me to answer it for you. And so Rabbi Groner told me he went back, studied the issue, reached a conclusion, and acted on it. And when he told the Rebbe the conclusion he reached, the Rebbe smiled and said, that's the conclusion I would have reached as well. Another story. Again, this applies to all of us. I might be telling stories about a Rebbe, and I might be telling some of the stories about rabbis, but guess what? Rabbis are human, regular human beings like all the rest of us, and these stories have applicability to every one of us here, both Jews and non-Jews as well. So a rabbi in New Haven, his name was Moshe Yitzchak Hecht, and I'm emphasizing his name because it's gonna be relevant to the story I'm telling. So Rabbi Moshe Yitzchak Hecht goes to New Haven to try and establish a Chabad community there and finds that he's not having a lot of success. He's having tremendous frustration. He's having his own spiritual problems, because guess what? Rabbis also have their own spiritual problems, ministers, priests, rabbis, Jews, non-Jews, Jews, Christians, Muslims, people can have periods of spiritual problems. So he's having his own issues. He's having issues with raising money, which can create its own set of problems. He has a lot going on. And he finally, Moshe Yitzchak Hecht, writes a letter to the Rebbe and says, I need you to help and I need you to do it all for me. The Rebbe writes back to him, Rabbi Hecht, I've already done as you've suggested and I have sent to New Haven a man named Rabbi Moshe Yitzchak Hecht. It is apparent that you don't know this man. You don't know the strength that were given to this man. The time has come for you to try and meet and know Moshe Yitzchak Hecht. How true is that for so many of us? Another rabbi, Tzvi Hirsch Weinrib, calls up the Rebbe's office, and he's not a Lubavitcher chassid. And he calls up the Rebbe's office. He doesn't even want to say what his name is. He's speaking to Rabbi Chodakov, the Rebbe's chief aide, and he's describing problems he's having, professional problems, also some spiritual issues, family issues. And uh, he lives in a, in a state in the United States called Maryland. And so he hears a voice in the background say, who are you speaking to? And he recognized, he knew the Rebbe's voice, and he didn't want to say who he was, so he said, it's a Jew from Maryland. And then he continues to tell Chodakov the problems he's having, and Chodakov's repeating them aloud, obviously, so that the Rebbe could hear. And finally, the Rebbe says, tell him that there's a Jew in Maryland he should consult named Tzvi Hirsch Weinrib. You know, this man's very name, and this was before we had caller ID. You know, so Weinrib said, that's me. And the Rebbe is told that that's who it is. The Rebbe says, Azoi, and if that's the case, tell him to consult with himself. Weinrib said that story transformed his life. He said he was the sort of person who whenever a problem came up in his life, the first thing he would always do is run to ask this person for help, advice, run to ask that person for advice, go to a therapist. He would never, he said he learned ever since that incident that the first person he needed to consult was himself. How many times do we not know what we really want? By the way, what in fact do we try and achieve generally when we go to therapy? We want to try and figure out 
what it is that we really want to do with our lives, what we want to accomplish, and how we can go about doing it. Because so many of us find that in our lives we don't achieve what we wanted to do. Not only because we're lacking Hatzlacha Bizman, not only because we're lacking success with time, but because we, count, we do things counterintuitively, we make mistakes, we, we mess up in relationships, people can get married and get divorced, and then find they get married again, and the same problems recur because they haven't dealt with their own issues. So Weinrib said he learned from the Rebbe to first consult with himself and to know himself. I want to go on with a couple of the other attributes of the Rebbe that I think have, have influenced me, I know, even in my own life since then. The Rebbe was very committed to the optimistic use of language. Already in the 1970s, he stopped using the term in English, retarded, to refer to children of limited mental capacities. He used the word special. And he said he wasn't just using it as a euphemism. He wasn't just using it because it sounds nicer to say of a child he's a special child than to say of a child that he's retarded. He said because the word retarded only defines one aspect of the child, limited mental faculties. The Rebbe was not being foolish. He knew that that was a very important thing to have, a very important element of one's life to be lacking in. But he said, but those children might have spiritual strength. They might have strengths in other areas. They might have strengths of empathy. They might have other strengths as well. Why define them only by that one trait? There was a Hebrew word the Rebbe would never use. I have no idea. How many people here do happen to know Hebrew? Okay, so I'm going to ask you how to say a certain word in Hebrew and just call it out. How do you say hospital in Hebrew? Beit Cholim. It's the only word that I know of that exists for hospital in Hebrew. The Rebbe had a personal campaign to get that word removed from the dictionary. He said, what does that word literally mean? If you know Hebrew, you know what it means. It means the house of the sick. By the way, how do you say hospital in German? And what does that literally mean? The house of the sick, okay, fine. Okay, so here's an example. Here's an example with a Rebbe. I actually knew that that was the answer in German. And I don't know a lot of German, but I, had, I did know that point. Okay, the Rebbe said, psychologically, what do you do to a person when they go to the house of the sick? How do they define themselves? A sick. So he wrote letters to all the hospitals in Israel, pleading with them to change their name to Beit Refuah, a house of healing. He said, not only is this psychologically better for people, but it's actually true. Doesn't the hospital think that its purpose is to heal people? Its purpose is not to keep people sick. And yet he recognized that this was an error that's often been made. I remember when I was a young person, probably 45 years ago, my mother, Helen Tolushkin of blessed memory, told me that when she was growing up in New York in the 1920s, they had hospitals called Home for the Incurables. Can you imagine telling a sick person, oh, we're transferring you to the Home for the Incurables? And so the Rebbe wanted to endow people with hope. I'll give you another example. And here, I really am limited in my knowledge of German. Is there, a, it, it, when you're working, there, there's a very commonly used word in English. I don't know what the German equivalent does the, for the word deadline. How do you say it in German? Oh, deadline is often commonly used here? Okay. The Rebbe didn't want people to use the word deadline. Can you imagine you're working under great pressure to finish something and you have enough pressure as it is and to boot somebody says it's a deadline. What's the implication? You know, it's the end. And so as a result in my own life, because people always like to know how is a writer influenced in his or her own life by what they do, I stopped using the word deadline. And what word did I come up with? Due date. What's the difference between deadline and due date? Deadline connotes death. A due date connotes birth, or new rebirth that's going to happen. So the Rebbe tried to avoid those sorts of negative words. There's a Yiddish expression, which I grew up hearing often, es ist schwer zu sein a Yid. It's hard to be a Jew. 
And a man once came to meet with the Rebbe and he was describing how his children, he had raised them to be committed Jews and their son doesn't seem interested at all and going on, and he's very unhappy and finally he says to the Rebbe, as his fair design, I yet it's hard to be a Jew. The Rebbe looked at the man and said, I'm curious, is that an expression you often use? And he said, yes, I do use it a lot because it's true. So the Rebbe said to the man, so why are you surprised that your son doesn't seem interested in being Jewish? <laughs> he said, do you think that's a way to make Judaism attractive to anybody? He said, there's another expression you could use. As is good to sign a Jew, it's good to be a Jew. And that will in turn infuse it with a greater sense of optimism. I want to mention one other attribute of the Rebbe and then I want to give a, a concluding thought. Two other attributes. One is, there's a commonly used expression in English. I don't know if there's a German equivalent, but I'll start by saying the expression in English and I'll leave one word out at the end to see if it's familiar to you. The commonly used American expression is, anything worth doing is worth doing well. Okay, that's a very common expression. Anytime you're a kid, you're a kid and you, you, know, you have to do your homework, you don't want to do your homework, you do it as rapidly as you can, your parents look at it and they see it's really not well done, and they say anything worth doing is worth doing well. The, Rebbe's, the Rebbe said anything worth doing is worth doing now. How often do we put off doing things that we know we need to do till a better time? A rabbi named Chopsy Katz from Pretoria, South Africa, had a congregation in Pretoria, South Africa. He was also the chaplain for the prisons. This is in the 1970s. Many of the Jews who are in prison in South Africa were there as political prisoners. And he comes to meet with the Rebbe. It's, it's in December. And he's visiting in New York. And the Rebbe is very interested in his work as a prison chaplain. He said, I'm curious, do the South African prison authorities recognize any of the Jewish holidays? And he said they recognize three. They recognize the high holidays, which is Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and Passover. We can bring in special food on Rosh Hashanah and Passover. Obviously, they can't bring in special food on Yom Kippur. It's a fast day. And the government recognizes that. The Rebbe said, what about Hanukkah? the holiday of lights, the holiday when I know you have a large menorah put up here. And he said, no, they don't recognize that. And the Rebbe said, do you know how important it is for people in a dark prison cell to be able to light a Hanukkah menorah to bring some light into their lives? And he speaks in such a passionate and emotional and, and logical way that Rabbi Katz says, I guarantee you by next year, Next year, I'm going to do all within my power to get the prison authorities to allow Jews to light Hanukkah candles. The Rebbe said, but Hanukkah is tomorrow night. Why not this year? He said, what can I do? I'm here, I'm here in Brooklyn. The prison authority is in Pretoria. So the Rebbe said, I assume he has a telephone. Go and call him. Call him right now. He said, it's four in the morning in South Africa. The Rebbe said, better. Call him definitely right now. He'll realize it must be a very important call. Now, the man was afraid to do it, but the Rebbe looked at him in such a way he couldn't resist. What's the worst thing the guy could do? Put him in prison. No, I don't think he was afraid of that. So he called up, he told the prison, the head of the prisons, the chaplain, he said, I'm sitting here with a rabbi who's one of the leading rabbinic figures in the world. And he went on speaking about Hanukkah. He got an order that that following night, Jewish prisoners throughout all of South Africa were allowed to light Hanukkah candles. Anything worth doing is worth doing now. Believe me, it applies in every one of our lives. Think of some telephone call you've been putting off that you know you should make. Think of some job, some task, some reconciliation with somebody you might have had a falling out with, something going on with your own children. If it's worth doing, worth doing it now. I'll tell you one last story about the Rebbe. I heard from a friend of mine, a man named Avraham Berkowitz. And it's a beautiful story of how he was inspired by some teachings of the Rebbe. When Avram Berkowitz, he's still quite a young man, he's in his late 30s. But when he was 20, he and a friend went out to Alaska. Now the truth is Chabad is one of the states in which already there is, uh, Alaska is one of the states in which already there is a Chabad representative, a rabbi named Yosef Greenberg. 
But they decided to go to the outlying communities in Alaska. To most of us, all of Alaska is an outlying community. But they decided, and they found an Israeli pilot who worked for an Alaskan airline who told them whenever he had empty seats, he let them come. And he would go to small cities throughout Alaska, and they would try and find Jews there. There's a certain reason why they, and I'll explain it to you in a few minutes, why he told me not to say the name of the city or the name of the person involved. They go to a small city in Alaska that's overwhelmingly comprised of Native Americans, what people who would normally be referred to as Eskimos. They get out of the plane, they find the mayor of the town, and they say, are there any Jews in this town? And the mayor says, I don't think there are any Jews here. But he recognized that these men seem to be religious Jews. He said, you know, the children in our public school never, uh, will probably never have a chance to meet a Jew in their lives. Would you be willing to go and meet with them? So they go to the local public school, and they meet with these young children, fifth grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. They tell them a few things about Judaism. The kids tell them about their beliefs. In fact, the children do an Eskimo dance for them, and the two young men get up and do a Hasidic dance. And then Rabbi Berkowitz says to the children, by the way, has anybody here ever met a Jew? And a little girl raises her hand, a young girl, and says, I know a Jew. He says, who? She said, my mother. And as you know, in Judaism, religion is transmitted through the mother. And it turned out her mother was a teacher at that local school. She was actually in the room. So after the session with the children, he goes over with the young girl to the mother. The mother explained that she grew up in what they called the lower 48, you know, the other 48 states of the United States. She had gone to Alaska, had fallen in love, loved the nature of Alaska, had fallen in love with an Alaskan man and was living there now, but she felt good about her Jewishness, but she knew her daughter knew nothing about it. And so she said to him, Rabbi, teach my daughter one thing that can always make her proud and f- to be part of, you know, to be a Jew. Berkowitz told me he knew this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, but he didn't know, but he was thinking desperately, what should he say? And it's a good thing for anybody here who's Jewish. It's a good thing here for anybody here who's Christian to think. If somebody said, teach me one thing about your religion that would really, could motivate somebody, a young, a young Jew, or in the case of a Christian, a young person who's from a Christian background, what would be the one thing you'd want to tell them? So he started telling the girl briefly about Shabbat, how every week, for 24, actually to safeguard that we don't desecrate Shabbat, for 25 hours, we refrain from all of our normal labors, we change our lives in many ways, it's a day of more introspection and spiritual activity, and he said, and how has the Shabbat begun every Friday? He said, it's begun with the Jewish women lighting Shabbat candles, Jewish women and girls lighting Shabbat candles, and it starts in the first place where the sun sets, So he asked the girl, where do you think the sun sets first? And so happened the girl's mother taught geography in the school. So she said probably like New Zealand, Australia, and then it moves across Asia to the land of Israel, then it goes into Europe and across Europe, then it goes across the ocean to the United States, to New York, Chicago, Seattle, then it comes to Anchorage. And he said about the last pace in the world is here in the Yupak territories of of Alaska, and every week all the Jewish people are looking to you to be the last woman who lights Shabbat candles. He's still in touch with that girl who often lights Shabbat candles. The reason he told me that I'm not allowed to say her name or the city is because he's afraid that thousands of Chabad emissaries will start calling this girl up every week to make sure she's lighting Shabbat candles. And, but he's still in touch with her. She lives now in Anchorage and has led a more Jewish life as a result. This is part of the appeal. The understanding that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The understanding that every act in life has the capacity to raise us to a level of a higher level of holiness that on any given day, no matter what the day was like before, we can change ourselves in that day. We can choose in the actions that we choose in any five minute period to make those five minutes holier and different. The Rebbe wanted to reach out. He wanted to start with the Jewish community. He wanted to reach out to every Jewish community, every Jew in the world, 
but like Abraham, he wanted to reach out to the whole world. And that we're gathered here today, the thought that we're gathered here today in Germany, where Jewish life suffered the most grievous blow it had suffered in the whole history of its diaspora, who would have thought, who would have thought we gather here to commemorate the life of a man who's trying to bring the world back to redemption, whose understanding of the capacity for goodness to overcome evil. In a world in which there was so much darkness, he chose to light a candle. And it's symbolically significant how Chabad became so associated with the candle lighting, both of the Shabbat and of the menorah. And he understood from that small light, a whole world could be illuminated. That's what I think we're commemorating today. Thank you very much. Thank you.